That's the worst part about using Skype. All right, guys. Hello and welcome to the Heresy Lodge. I am your host, Dylan, the constant co-host over here. Gavin Franklin. And guys, we are remote this week. It just made sense for both of us to do it this way. And honestly, sometimes I I almost like the remote ones because I don't feel like obligated to play a game and be like, Ooh, I'm going to be up late tonight. Yeah, that's <laughs> what like, I, I was thinking this week. I was like, I don't want to bring that obligation. But like it, it's like every other week is kind of perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, you get burned out really fast if you do it every week. But you got Caldor Drago coming. Eventually. He's still not here. I got a uh, an email from Games Workshop today saying that some of the models that I was waiting for are back in the back in the store. I was like, there well, you go. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Based off of uh, other people's experiences, I'm going to say they're not really back in the store yet. Yeah, you know, it'll be in the store and then it'll ship after like, you know, like a week and a half after you purchased it. And then you know, mm-hmm. they apparently like pay like snails to deliver it. Yep. Exactly. And they may not show up. May not show up. Yeah. Every time like I've ordered from them, they like always go to like Ohio and says like it's being delivered in Ohio. And then it somehow magically ends up here. (laughs) You're not even close. (laughs) How's your key so fast? (laughs) You were in Ohio an hour ago. (laughs) It's real weird. That is nuts. Yeah, our first X Fire box never even showed up. So Yeah. They very good experiences so far with Games Workshop. But yep. anyway, what are you drinking tonight, Gavin? I am drinking some wine. <laughs> it's mm. very nice. Which is that uh, Oliver Blueberry Moscato? The fact that you know that. Is well, I saw you pull it out of the fridge and I saw the, like, the, I could tell it was Oliver. What's and I crazy? Know the color. <laughs> That's so crazy. So, like, that, well, the fridge is like way back there. So, like, you, you saw, like, the shape, the color, and, like, maybe a hint of a label. And you're like, that's Oliver's Blueberry Moscato. Look, all right. We, we enjoy wine in this household, okay? <laughs> yeah, this is not great wine, in my opinion. Um, but, yes, just Oliver's Blueberry Moscato. Uh, blueberry Moscato is definitely, like, your starting wine. Yes. I, I'm a wine fan as well. I do enjoy wine. I have no problems with it. Um, I don't like a lot of super dry wines. Oh, see, I love dry wine. Yeah, that's kind of your speed. But the thing that's frustrating about this, and the reason I'm drinking Oliver, Katie has like 75 wine bottles, and it's <laughs> filled to the brim. She's purchased it over the years and never drinks any of them. She's just like, I have a wine fridge and I'm a wine collector. I'm like, that sounds great. Let's drink it. She's like, no, like some of them are super rare. So I went through like all the wines last week and I was like, you can get every single one of these at Kroger. Like every single one of these wines. Well, you see, the thing about Oliver, Oliver is like, you know, like cheap here and like everywhere, but it's like world renowned. Like it's very, like it's in like fancy restaurants. What's well, so crazy? Because we do consider it cheap wine. Yeah. But it's just because they're here. And, you know, they don't have to, sh- they have to ship it very far. Yeah. So Oliver, Oliver Winery is a winery. Um, Southern Central, Indiana. Bloomington, for any of college fans, that's where I use that. Yeah, close to IU. It's, they make amazing wine. I Their think. wine is good. Very good. Um, and this is a Blueberry Moscato. How about you, good sir? Oh, boy. I brought some big guns today. So... We haven't had Quaff on in a very long time. What so I picked that up. Special? It is the peanut butter busted knuckle. Mm, that is a big gun. That's a huge beer in Indiana. It's so good. I Nothing. really like the peanut butter. Have you had the peanut butter one? Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I've I like the this. peanut butter one a lot better because it's like sweeter. Mm. And it's not as like, it heavy. I'm a big fan. So this is a peanut butter porter. It's very, very good. Busted Knuckles, probably their most famous beer. Mm-hmm. Although, I don't know how famous they are outside of Indiana. Probably not very. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of their blonde. The, I really like the strawberry. We actually did the strawberry blonde in one episode. Yeah, it was very good. Um, uh, yeah, I, will, I like that brewery a lot. Quaffon yeah. is phenomenal. I also just love their pizza, too. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Yep, for sure. All so right. this week. Mm-hmm. We, 
Not yet. We have to do our housekeeping real quick. So, guys, as always, if you want to contact us, you can do that by tweeting us at Heresy Lodge. You can join our Discord at the link pinned to the top of the Twitter. You can always email us as well at theheresylodge at gmail.com. If you're on the YouTube, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. We always like to have fun with you guys. And let's talk some Primarchs. The Primarchs. It is here. It is okay. Four stories. It is okay. It is four stories divided into four primarchs. The first primark and the first story is The Reflection Cracked about Fulgrim, written by Graham McNeil. Yes, and it is. <laughs> let me tell you, I think Graham McNeil's got some weird ass kinks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, 100%. <laughs> he loves writing about the Emperor's Children. <laughs> and specifically Fulgrim. <laughs> yeah, this story is very interesting. So last time we talked in the previous book or the previous podcast where the book Fulgrim left off was Fulgrim was possessed by some sort of demon. And in this book, it is from the point of view primarily of Lucius. You get a, a little bit of point of view of Fulgrim. Um, but it's primarily Lu- Lucius, who is having dreams about the auditorium from the crazy, like, opera scene. Yeah, the, the weird murder orgy thing. So he keeps, like, being drawn to this. And the Emperor's Children's ship, like, it talks about him, like, walking through the ship in the beginning of the book. Has turned into some weird <laughs> shit. We hear a lot of um, orgies going on, a lot of just like murdering, torturing, crazy stuff. Um, it's ve- it's very much so. Like after reading the description of this book, there's always this like kind of question, like, "Hey, which traitor legion would you least like to just appear <laughs> to try and kill you?" Like definitely the Emperor's children. Yeah, like, you don't, I don't know wanna... what they're gonna do to you. <laughs> yeah, like give me Angron, like any day of the week. Like he'll kill me. It'll be it'll be like scary but fast. But that's how I would want to go is to some corn berserkers. You, you don't want to be like held captive and have things shoved into orifices that shouldn't have things shoved into. <laughs> that's that's it's so crazy because like I could see like corn is like my number one choice. Like give me corn every day of the week. The second would probably be Zeech. Yeah, it makes sense. It, could, it would get a little weird, but kind of cool. I think. You know? Yeah, I mean, Nurgle, like, it's just kind of gross. Yeah, Nurgle's gross. I, like, I'm really caught in between, like, which would be worse. So, like, Nesh is just uncomfortable. <laughs> so it's just very, okay, guys, I'm very uncomfortable right now. Like, I'd rather get killed by a bloodthirster than feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> guys, I, I, I really don't like this at all. <laughs> you're, you're sitting there. <laughs> in Fulcrum's chambers, and you're like, mm, yeah, I would rather be in actual hell you're right just, now. <laughs> you're just watching him just like rub oil on himself. You're like, I don't like this. I don't know where this is going, but it's not going to be good. <laughs> Give me Grandfather Nurgle, please. I will take the rotting flesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, there's this very well written, I think that's a great word for it, uncomfortability. <laughs> like, I read this, and you just feel uncomfortable. When you read yeah. it, it's, it's fucking weird. Like, well, really well described. It's unnerving. Honestly, I don't even know if, like, you could, like, release something like that. Like, nowadays, if, like, it was, like, something, like, pop culture that wasn't Warhammer. Right? Because, like, yeah. Warhammer, like, we have our own, you know, Community. stereotypes. Yeah. Whereas, like, if it was something on TV, they'd be like, how dare you put that on TV? And it's like, I can't believe I read that. <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing books can get away with a lot because not a lot of people read them. <laughs> this is fair. <laughs> you put it on Netflix, it reaches a much broader audience. Um, but yeah, you could you can write whatever you want. I mean, they let Twilight get released, and that was basically <laughs> that was very uncomfortable. I don't know. I'd rather be invaded by Slanesh than uh, vampires from Twilight. Five hundred year old vampires like dating a fifteen year old girl, staring her down. <sighs> <laughs> oh, God. Take, take me to Fulgrim, please. <laughs> Bring back the oil. 
Uh, but this, uh, <laughs> we're going way off track here. No, no, so, this is pretty much is the story right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Fulgrim, they've been like traveling and doing nothing, right, for a while. And apparently, Horus has requested that Fulgrim just go straight to Terra, which is weird. Well, he was probably just like, I don't want to see any more of this. Just go the furthest away point. We'll meet you eventually. Yeah. So we have to think about where the other, where the legions are going right now. We know he sent away the Alpha Legion. We know he sent away uh, the Night Lord's Legion. Does Horus really think that he can just... Oh, well, Word Bearers too, because Word Bearers are at, uh, whatchamacallit, the Krieg. The Krieg, yeah, that's right. The Word Bearers are gone. Uh, we're pretty sure from what we've seen that the world eaters will be joining them at some point. Yeah. So that makes sense. He's got the Iron Warriors, the Death Guard, which we saw in the last short story. A lot of the Death Guard are gone. Yeah. The Emperor's Children and the Luna Wolves. Yeah. I, and and just, we also have like, an upcoming book of the Iron Warriors and Emperor's Children. Now, I don't Doing know some, if that's. Post is fun or not? It is. Okay. Well, the premise of it is, yeah, it's about this angel. It's Angel Exterminatus, which right. is what you see in this book. So, this this book is supposed to be the segue between Fulgrim and Angel Angel Exterminatus. <clears throat> um, so, they finally Fulgrim announces himself, and like he, he's like, okay, we're going to. I'm going to tell you guys where we're going, and you see this like weird thing in the emperor's children where like people will fall in and out of favor of fulgrim and that's mm -hmm. how like they act so lucius is like up there with the commanders yeah but he's just a line soldier <laughs> and they're like you shouldn't be here boy and he's like fuck you and they can't do anything about it pretty much wasn't it didn't him and Sol Tarvitz become captains at in fulgrim and the, but they were sent to isfahan because like they weren't like trusted enough yes and um Edelon is met. He meets Lucius outside, and Lucius is like, "I can't wait to kill you." <laughs> yeah. And Edelon's I love Lucius. Like, Edelon's like, "It'll never happen." The Primarch loves me too much. Turns out he that was not. a lie. So, what so there we go. yeah. So we talked about this last book or episode. Damn it! I did the same thing you did. Where there are two characters that die in this in this book. One of them being someone that we actually were like, "Hell yeah." And it's Edelon. He gets completely beheaded by Fulgrim. Yeah, so he basically, like, interrupts Fulgrim and asks, like, because Fulgrim tells them that they're going to some backwater planet. Yeah, they're going to some, like, random planet that had, like, mechanic. all they, like, they, yeah, it was, like, some, like, random mechanic on planet. And they were, like, I did not see any of the, like, strategic value of this planet. That's what Edelon said, yeah. Yeah. And so Fulgrim, um, Killed him. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, whoa. It's Which, like, yeah. Great that he died, but like at the same time, it was like, that's it? Yes. Like we talked about this. Like if it wasn't for Nimiel, it would have been a cooler death. But because of Nimiel, it was like, oh, this book was Spoiler alert for though. the Dark Angels. Uh, we're going Nimiel. through it here. <laughs> sure, we're sure, going sure. through it here, yes. Full so. spoiler alert. I forgot, we forget to do this for every review. <laughs> oh, yeah, we always do. Sorry, guys. But um, <laughs> we have the death of Edelon, which was super awesome. And it yeah, blew it really, my mind. and it like, happens like super early, too. So like, oh, yeah. Fuck, this is going to be yeah. awesome. When I read it, I was like, this book is going to do some shit. And it did and it didn't. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much the only thing that this story accomplished was the killing of Edelon. <laughs> yeah, honestly, because like we after like this happens, we have Lucius... And he goes to the auditorium. Well, you go, first they go to the planet. And you get a yeah. scene with Fulgrim. Basically, there's like a bunch of like giant mirrors. Yeah. It made Some of like crystals. crystal thing. And he's having a conversation with something that wants to like. He's having a conversation with himself. Yeah. And in your mind, you're thinking that whatever it is in the mirror is Fulgrim. Mm -hmm. And what is actually talking is the demon in Fulgrim's body. Yeah. But you come to find out that yeah, Fulgrim, <laughs> at one point after Isfahan, 
expelled the demon from his body, but is still holding him captured, captured, ca ca captive, 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 yep. And that's when you get Lucius back on the ship, kills all of the fucking Phoenix guard, which, like, sure, but I swear every time we've seen, like, the honor guard, they have sucked ass. And we talked about this last episode, like, there is absolutely no reason that, like, none of them could even touch Lucius. Like, they're supposed to be, like, the best of the best. Yeah. Of their legion. Like, I just don't understand. It's very weird how just, like, shitty they were. And they were guarding the auditorium because Fulgrim said that you're not allowed to go in there. And that's when he discovers that the painting of Fulgrim that What's-Her-Face did is actually, like, perfect. Yeah. Like, it's not made of shit anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The whole thing was weird. I think it's, like, a really nice picture of Fulgrim. And he thinks that Fulgrim is trapped in the painting and that a demon has possessed Fulgrim, which is true, but also not true. Yeah, because then it gets weird, because then he calls the other captains, and he tells them, you know, and, like, Fabius and who's the first captain? Ventanus or something like that. Yeah, they actually were like, I also think something weird is going on with Fulgrim. Really? <laughs> so, they're, so then they're Marius, like, the Orsine. This... Yeah, that's it, Orsine. So they hatch this giant plan to capture Fulgrim. <laughs> They do. And then all they do is sexually harass them. <laughs> yeah, so they basically... Like, they, more, they do more than sexually harass. They, they, they kind of rape them, but assault. I don't know if... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't like... They were like, hey, girl, nice ass. <laughs> but we're like, and I Stop would it. smack that so hard. They're Stop like, oh, I'm ass. smacking it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> No, so he gets put on this torture chamber where Fabius Bile constructs his plan that he's going to basically torture the demon out of Fulgrim. And his idea is a demon doesn't worry about pain, but a Primarch's body can take so much pain that a demon will maybe be expelled if, before Fulgrim dies. <laughs> and yeah, everyone. Let jack him off real quick. <laughs> 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 but don't worry, I'm going to do it with this spiked glove. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty much what happened. So um, they torture him in various ways. One of the ways is uh, putting um, a butt plug in Fulcrum. <laughs> yep, they did. <laughs> they did. And it was and like as, very... as there's a butt plug in, then we have Lucius just like stabbing him with like a knife. Yep. Like I'm imagining like, like, like a sharp knife, like, like, like just like a butter knife is like jamming into him like. Yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? He's just like, oh, yeah, it feels so good. Yeah, Volcom is like actually saying that. Yeah, He's it's like, like Mr. Slay from South Park. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a weird scene to read about. Super well described, but just fucking weird. Oh, almost too well described. <laughs> oh, my cram, dude, my guy. <laughs> yeah, like I said, like the last episode, you're like, you gotta know, like, the editor's like, Graham, what the fuck? Especially since we know his editor's a woman, too. So she's probably like, seriously, Graham, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think, like, all this happens, and Fulgrim is talking this whole time about the whole concept of the universe. And I wasn't even paying attention to it. Like, I no. thought that part was super weirdly placed because he's like, they're like, you're a demon. He's like, are you sure I'm a demon? Because think about the, the vastness of the universe and the great plan. It all comes to chaos and anarchy or whatever. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, first off, I'm not going to take some sort of, like, universe lesson from some <laughs> dude that's begging to be tortured from anal beats. <laughs> so in that and getting stabbed and. Yeah, like, I'm not. The whole here, time, like, like I'm still like, you've got to be possessed because this is weird. <laughs> yeah, and then he reveals that he's not possessed. He, like, breaks off the chains. He's like, I'm Fulgrim. Did yeah, you think you could... They, like, brought me? out this, like, super torture machine from Fabius, and then they, they pull it out on him, and then he's like, eh, now that this is done, I've been, I've been Fulgrim the whole time. I, yeah. I cast away the demon. And Lucius <laughs> was like, oh, yeah, 
I totally didn't realize, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> and everyone was just super on board with the fact that even though Fulgrim's been acting weird, it's just Fulgrim. <laughs> <laughs> like, they definitely agreed, like, hey, this is kind of fucked up. But they, at the end of the day, they were like, it's all good. I wonder if it's, like, supposed to represent, like, Fulgrim, like, throwing away his, like, thing for, like, perfection. Because he can't be striving for it anymore, right? Like, all the weird shit that he's doing and everything is, like, isn't, like, how the Legion was. This is the problem I have with that theory. It's, like, if you told Fulgrim that, he would probably go on some, like, three-hour rant lecture about how what he's doing is actually perfection. I'm sorry, I'm buttoning a shirt. This is what the perfection is. <laughs> <laughs> he kills like a few Emperor's children on the yeah. way. Does some stuff. I think I some know. captains. Yeah. No one that you knew before the story. Uh, but it's kind of fun to read from Lucia's perspective. I enjoy it. Maybe just not so much anal torture next time. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> but you know but, what? I would rather have that one than our next story. Oh, yeah. So, the next story. Uh, the next story, if I can pull up the list again. The Fist of Iron, something like that? Uh, I think it's, is it Iron Within? Oh, maybe it's, is it? No. Feet of Iron. Yeah, Feet of Iron. By Nick Kaim. Oh. Honestly, this story, like, made me like drag through the book like this is like the i haven't had it like drag like had it like drag through a book since nemesis and man this one was like killing me like the entire time reading this was um it was the worst one by far and it was and, long as fuck yeah so this one is about the iron warriors iron hands iron warriors would have been cool yeah <laughs> no this is about the iron hands and like we discussed in our prequel episode, is this book, especially the short story, like the Iron Hands haven't been very prevalent except for in Fulgrim. And when you meet them in Fulgrim, they're struggling with a space threat that Fulgrim has to solve for them. And yeah. this is like the exact same thing. Like they're struggling with the threat and they needed outside help. Yeah. And uh, there is no redeeming qualities from the Iron Hands. No, it like I almost like it just doesn't make sense because like Manus just never learned his mistake. Like this is before Isvan, obviously, mm-hmm. and like he basically had the exact same thing happen in this story that happens mm-hmm. at Isvan, where he's like, "No, we just have to do this," and he we rushes in, and then he gets fucking killed. It's like, right, oh. surprise! He almost dies in this one. Yeah. Um, also. Just a real quick track back, because I did realize that these stories are all connected in various ways, which I find interesting. Um, The first story with Fulgrim at the end, he talks about how they're making their way to the Angel Exterminatus. Mm -hmm. We get that in this book as well. So with the Iron Hands, they're making their way through this desert, fighting some Eldar forces, trying to locate this pylon. And the Iron Hands are mechanical enhanced beings who believe that the flesh is weak and therefore they think that most of the um, military that's with them are also weak. And I don't want to harp on this too much because I think we really covered a lot of it in the prequel. But basically throughout the entire campaign, they come across um, situations where they have to rely on their human counterparts and their augmentations turn against them because of sorcery um or like they like the the faulty of them just pushing ahead and being like we're just gonna go we're just we're yeah. just gonna go because what guess what we're just gonna go because we're good and like the whole time it's hilarious because ferris manis is in like this walking tent with <laughs> ac in it it's literally like an ice mountain in the desert <laughs> yeah and he's like oh these fucking humans are so weak <laughs> like, <"Dude, laughs> fuck you uh, yeah, I had so many issues with Manus. Like, he's just not like personable at all. No. He, 
has no redeeming factors at all. Like honestly, like the the entire legion kind of sucks. So in the story, they make their way to these elven ruins where they think the pylon might be, and Ferris Manus takes his um, honor guard. What are they called? Yeah, I don't remember. Murlocs. Yeah, 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 something like that. He takes them down this like slope of sand where they get surrounded by witchcraft from the Eldar that turns their aug- augmentics against them and they start murdering themselves and the, each other with the augmentics. And I think these are the har- Harlequins. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah, it is kind of cool. Um, and at the same time that this is going on, you have like an Eldar seer of some sort that is like the whole purpose of them being on the planet is to warn Ferris Manus about his fan. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah. Um, not a Primark I would pick. No, especially like, because at one point, like he like is in this like tomb like area, and there's like all these statues. He doesn't fucking like realize who any of them are until Fulgrim. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, how do you not put like two and two together? In this fight, he gets separated from his like yeah. uh, legion, and he ends up in these catacombs. Um, and I think this is kind of crazy too. I think the planet that they're on is the planet that the Space Marine ends up at the end of the Astartes project. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, so like uh, this book ties a lot into the Astartes short story. It's like they read this book and they're like, let's make something from some of this. It's really interesting. Uh, but yeah, he sees all these statues that are supposed to represent his brothers. Um, like you very easily see like the lion, um, oh, uh, Alpharius and Omegon. Two of uh, them have their faces scratched off. Yeah, this is the two lost Primarchs, and like Lehman Russ is there. And like Ferris Manus, he's like, he understands that he's being like herded through this maze, but there's also some sort of like evil being hunting him in That's this like maze. Snake. Yeah. So he, uh, at one point, starts having, like, visions of, like, weird shit. Like, he sees his head being decapitated. He has his burning well, he was having dreams his neck. about it before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, like, there's, he was getting beheaded, and, like, it, it was, like, he always, like, they're, like, he kept, like, scratching out his neck as if there, there was, was, like, there. a scar on his neck, too, like, a, a rash. Yeah. And so, like, this, this book basically reveals that Ferris Manus had premonitions about his death. And they didn't listen to him. Yeah, so he has this like he gets attacked by this demon thing that's some sort of snake. And it gets revealed that the Eldar accidentally let this demon in. Like this demon is actually trying to kill Ferris Manus. It's not part of the warning. Um, but Ferris Manus kills the demon. Yep. He like chokes it to death. Yeah. And that's when the Eldar reveal themselves and they're like, hey. You need to know that you're gonna die on his fan if you go, basically. Yeah, but this only... is definitely one of the Eldar from like the Cabal or something. Maybe. Or I... it's what's his face from Program. Eldred. Yeah, Eldred. So I think because there's a farce here, right? In this book, it's like a, it's like two Eldar, and one of them never reveals their name. Yeah, I think that might be Eldred. Yeah, I can see that. Here I am. So there's uh, Lath, Lath Surreal. Yeah, that's probably it. Lath Surreal. Uh, that's the Eldar that's like trying to convince Ferris Manus. And the only badass line that I like really got from this was when Ferris Manus was like, "Hey." I might die, but that's the difference between, like, the Eldar and every human. Is the fact that, like, you guys see the future and you're owned by it. Yeah. And we, like, shape it. So I'm going to go to Isfahan anyway and do what I have to do because that's what I do. Like, I'm not going to let your vision of the future, like, shape my actions. Yeah, although you didn't even, like... Listen. I don't know. Yeah, like... He didn't even take it as like any type of uh, like a warning or anything. He was just almost like, "You're just wrong. You're an idiot. You don't know shit." Yeah, 
all, all in all, like he's this very rash. And even till the end of the story, when he finally gets reunited with his legion, they destroyed the Eldar crystal. Just very rash in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and he obviously doesn't grow as a character. And he doesn't need to because he dies. <laughs> yeah, but I kind of wish it was more of like like a tragedy like it should be. Like we talked about like in the last episode about how it makes no sense that him and Fulgrim are so close. Yeah. And like this makes it even like more prevalent like how like different they are i would agree i think he's a pretty poorly written character i don't think we get a lot more from him and it it kind of i think they were like well we only have enough writing to make 17 primarchs look good <laughs> <laughs> so let's kill Fer- ferris man is pretty early and that's just that's ferris's stick he's just the first to die there's a lot of iron hands like fans out there that's great. I'm not a fan of the Legion. I think there's like you can make them cool, um, but I would urge you. Or I, I would liked like them more in Fulgrim because I didn't know how. Like, like yes, like Manus like seemed a little bit incompetent, but it was like oh maybe like he was just being like rash because you know you just couldn't believe all what's happening. But this just like reinforces how incompetent he is. And working with incompetent people all the time, I'm like, fuck incompetent people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he doesn't have a lot of redeeming qualities. And if you're an Iron Hands fan, that's great. But I would I would like implore you to give me a Reason. section <laughs> section of like the lore that talks about how awesome he he was. Other yeah, maybe than like, the remaining Legion becomes badass. Who knows? Yeah, like maybe it's because like we talked about in like no no fear how he was like man Ferris Manus was one of the best Primarchs. Is he didn't say the best? He said it would. It, see, that's the difference. Yeah, Roberto didn't say it was the best. He said he, if he had him on his team, he would know exactly how he would act. Yes, not that he was the best. He's like he's gonna go head in first, so we will plan around that. <laughs> yeah, and which is what Roberto Gilman does. So yeah, that that makes sense. So that's. That's Feet of Iron. Next, we have The Lion. Now, this, this was, was, it was good. Yes, it was my favorite story, um, personally. Did Has you one like of my the, least favorite moments. Yes. Did you like the Alpha Legion story more? Um, no, I think I like this one more. Like, the Alpha Legion one's cool, but I don't like reading about the back and forth. Yeah. It oh, almost really? like, annoyed me reading that. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that aspect. Almost, it was almost like watching Ocean's Eleven or something. See, I I enjoy watching it, but I don't enjoy reading it because, like, when I'm reading, I'm just like, "What the fuck?" Mm-hmm. So this one was written by Gav Thrope, who wrote Deliverance Lost, which is a pretty decent book, and he's written some other um, short stories. Yep. His next book coming up. It's a while away. It's not till Korax. Yeah, we didn't talk about Nikam. He does the Salamander books. Yes, that's right. Um, so, the lion. Uh, the lion. This picks up all of the all of the like Dark Angels books are very sequential. Yes. Like you could pick up um, Descent of Angels, and then Fallen Angels. And then any of the short stories in the order that they're released. And that is <laughs> yep. exactly how the story goes. So this picks up right after the last short story where he got the shit beat out of him by the Night Hunter. Yep. And he's just kind of brooding. First, the, well, you know, so this comes up like after the night, like the Night Hunter thing. Where the hell was during that? What? Where the hell was Nemiel during that time? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is, it's really weird. So, I'm trying to think of when we get the next book for the, uh, the first. Dude, I think, um, shit. I think it's, like, way down. I think it's, like, in, like, the 30s or 40s. Right, the next, like, big Dark Angel book. I don't know. Like what? 
Cause I'm I pretty sure was just, I was just a, looking earlier. There's a Dark Angel book, Angels of Caliban, which is 38. Yeah. But I think there's one before that about there? about the um, like fight between the Night Lords and. I could see so. The maybe only other one I could see maybe Eros? is Legacy is the Betrayal? The Damnation of Pythos? I've heard that one's really fucking bad, so I hope it's not that one. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> basically, I think what happened in this situation was very similar to what happened in the Fulgrim story. But they were like, hey, we started writing the next story of the Dark Angels, and there's just one person that doesn't quite fit the bill. <laughs> And that's For no the, reason. Yeah. So, synopsis of the story. He's really upset about the whole Night Lords keeping them, like... Occupied. Occupied. And they find out that there is a planet under attack um, with fighting between the Death Guard and the Iron Hands. Um, and the Lion says that the planet is some unique planet that there's a weapon at that he and Mortarian at some point prior to the beginning of this, the horse. Heresy. Heresy, yeah. Um, fought over. Or, like, fought to maintain. Like, they didn't yeah. fight each other yet. So, he had to go. He decided that that was more important than fighting the Night Lords, so they go into... They take like a decent amount of Dark Angels with them to go and try and secure this planet. And that is when the Night Lords are following them through the warp, which is very strange because you're not able to do that typically with warp travel. Although, which is also weird because we also have things like Battle for the Abyss when they were totally following each other through the warp. Yep. So warp travel makes no fucking sense. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think in Battle for the Abyss, it was more like, we know where they're going, but they're not necessarily, like, following them. Maybe. Because at this, like, they both had their individual Geller fields up. Yeah. This, in this situation, you had the the Dark Angel ship and the Night Lord ship, like, right there in each other's fields. Mm -hmm. So I think... It was just very strange because the first legion took a lot of evasive maneuvers and the night lord ship was able to just follow them through so they're pretty sure they were using some crazy warp, warp technology fuckery. yeah um so throughout this period though it's very clear that the lion is very untrusting of almost anyone on the ship um his like ship captain who's a dark angel um He's questioning everybody. Uh, I'm pretty sure this captain's like a human. No, the the like person in charge of the ship. It's a um, it's a dark angel. You sure? I could have sworn yeah. like there's like no like Astartes that were really space minded. Uh, Stinius, the first legion dark angels, captain of the invincible region. Mm. Reason, yeah. And then you have, like, the navigator that's there. Um, but basically, like, he is really upset because he trusted Perturabo. He trusted um, the Night Lords. Yeah. And he also, he has insight into what's going on in Caliban. Mm -hmm. We get that at the end of the book. We have no idea how. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who the hell that was. Yeah, uh, he he doesn't like know. He doesn't like like he he never says in the book like, oh, Luther has betrayed me. But like he kind of feels like he's been betrayed. So he's yeah, because at one point everybody. like the Night Lords have like said like a couple times now that was like, you know, aren't you worried about Caliban? What's going on there? Yeah, well, it's fucking the Lion's fault. So I don't know why. Oh, I agree. He's, he's like, for some reason, when I abandoned half my legion to stay on a planet for a few hundred years or whatever. They got upset with me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't talk to them anymore. Like, whatever. <laughs> Jeez, let me just get over it. Just make me military boys to play with. Yeah, for real. So I can kill randomly. Yeah. So he, like, 
he's having this like these brooding moments. And then one thing that was really cool about this book is the Night Lords employ some demons, which is strange because the Night Lords in my mind didn't typically do that. Um, but the Night Lords are also very war bandish. So like not everyone is following what the Night Hunter is saying because they're all criminals and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it's possible that's just this section, but typically the Night Lords have remained neutral to demons and they haven't like particularly allied themselves with a chaos god. But in this book, they are being attacked by demons of Zeech. Uh, so you see pink whores and um, more importantly, you see um, a changer of ways. The bird thingy magic. Right, because the keeper of secrets is Slanesh, right? Yeah, I don't fucking know. Yeah, so a changer of ways. <laughs> he's a greater demon of Zinch. And we're seeing more and more greater demons. But this is the first greater demon that we saw. And the lion killed it pretty easily. Um, but it was just a really badass, like, warp demon fight. They were very well described. It was very interesting. Um... But yeah, like the the demon tried to convince the lion to join them. The lion's like, no, that's how it ended. So they make it to the planet and the lion and like Corse Wayne. Oh, we skipped the most important part of the book. Uh, we skipped Nimiel. Oh, shit. That happened that early? Yeah, because what happened was while they were being attacked by demons, oh, they realized right, he brought in the librarians. Yes, they realized that, like, oh, okay, the best thing for us to do against the demons is to use psychers. And he was like, Nimiel, go bring me those psychers. And that's when Nimiel was like, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you can't do it? It's like, it's against the Emperor's decree. He's like, doesn't matter. Go do it. And Nimiel was like, I can't. So then the lion kills him. Yep, just beheads him. Right yeah. then and there. Punches him in the face. Yeah. I'm just like, huh. Yeah. And it's crazy because Nimiel was such a huge character in yeah, two I mean, of the books. He was the main character. Yeah. I mean, especially in like Fallen Angels, like it was literally just him and Zahara the whole time and yeah. just their point of view is like over and over again. Like, what was the point of having that character, period? Yeah, and him go through all the like ranks and shit. Just to get destroyed for like nothing. What I'm hoping is when we see the return of the lion to Caliban, you have Zahariel who's like wanting to join the lion and like the Luther's messed up. I don't want to betray you. The Luther. I always call him the Luther. <laughs> the Luther. The Luther. So Luther's messed up. I don't want to betray you. And that's when it's revealed that his cousin Nimiel was killed by the lion. And that's when Zahariel's like, <laughs> for oh, shits and gigs. Okay. Fuck that. <laughs> Although that kind of come that does come back like full circle, right? Like him like not wanting to bring back the librarians, him killing them meal. He, he fucking Zara's he is a librarian. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. weird. Yeah. I, so the killing of Nemeal's my least favorite part of this entire book. Not just I just hate that that happens in like a short story. Yes, I, I like Nimiel, I could see no, both Nimiel and Zahariel dying, but it's got to be in a cool way. Yeah, I mean, you, you had two books about them. Yeah, and like I'd like to see the story of the Dark Angels through those two point of views. Yeah, I can't imagine like reading like the Fight of Caliban or whatever it's called, and like having read like the other two books and then get into that and be like, where the Where's hell's the... Nimiel? Very weird. Um, and you see like. He killed him because he didn't follow his order. And he asked Corse Wayne throughout this book, like, would you pick me over the Emperor? Like, he's being jealous. He's very jealous. The fact that, like, some of Horus's, like, uh, some, some of Horus's legionnaires turned against the Emperor. He's like, well, yeah. wouldn't my legionnaires do the same thing? Do they like me as much as the Horus's legionnaires like him? Yeah, it's weird. Very weird. He's like a little schoolgirl, and like a whole, every single time I read about the lion, I'm like, this man is not fit for duty. <laughs> no, not at all. It's like, damn it, why is Luther not in charge of this damn legion? It is. It's crazy. It's he's a, a child, and he reacts in fits of rage. So this is another thing that we see where it's like 
it's a mirror of Fulgrim and the lion here. Think about this. What's the difference between Fulgrim and the lion? One sides with the emperor, one doesn't. Yeah, sure, one likes butt plugs, but like <laughs> at the end of the day, we don't you know, know what the lion's into. <laughs> the the lion has broken the emperor's decree in IKEA. Yep. By definition, he's a traitor. Yeah, although we all say Corvus Corax break it too. By definition, Corvus Corax is a traitor. We see the lion here actively kill one of his legionnaires, just like Fulgrim did in the Shattered Mirror reflection, whatever. Reflection crack. Reflection crack. Yeah, we saw like we see that. Like the lion is going just as crazy. He's losing his mind, his sanity, and he's reacting the same exact way the traitor primarchs are. So it's like, hey, it kind of seems to me like the only difference between the good legions and the bad legions is the fact that the good legions were just like, well, we're going to side with the emperor instead of horse. That's it. Pretty much. And I think this this story kind of revealed to me that like... Ikea was useless? That what? Nikea was completely useless. Yeah, Nikea was very useless. There's very few legions. Like, if you really hold Nikea as a standard, there's very few legions that you could, could really, truly consider loyal legions. Yeah, because I mean, we just dropped the first and the Raven Guard. Yeah, just off, just off of Nikea. And I mean, the Emperor said, like, if you betray this edict or edict, whatever it is, like, I will kill you. Yeah. You really like eat the blood angels, they use psychers as well. Um, the only like, I honestly truly believe that the only legion that you can truly consider loyal to a T is the Imperial Fists. <laughs> like, Train wreck in this court right now, like, yes, <laughs> the Imperial Fists. Like, even like you can look at the Ultramarines, but you have you have Rabute Gilman, at least he approaches it logically, where he's like. Librarians would be very useful against these demons, and I think that Nikea might have been swayed because of that. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe the Salamanders. I don't know whether or not they're still employing, um, but maybe the Salamanders are another like truly loyal legion. Um, I know for a fact the White Scars aren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, we got to the planet. We get there, and like the strategic thing that the lion does is he gets in between. The Iron Fist and the Death Guard, because he's like, we don't know if any of them's a traitor, but the Death won't shoot us in the middle. <laughs> well, see, that's it's just another weakness, I think, because of course Wayne was trying to convince him, hey, maybe we should just take an active stance against the Death Guard since we know they're traitors. Yeah. And the lion's like, well, you know, who knows what's happening after the death of Ferris Manus, and maybe these Death Guard are good Death Guard. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for real. So like as soon as we find out that Typhus is one of them there. Yeah, and like all this a lot of what happened in the end could have been avoided if the lion would have just killed Typhus. Yep. Um, but he didn't. And I think that was a moment of weakness. I think that's the lion having his trust issues destroy the you know, the whole like plan. Yeah. That's how that works. Uh but basically Typhus is there. He's been really following Granddaddy Nurgle. Typhus he has is a psyker. He's there alone, sent by Nurgle, not Mortarian, to retrieve this um, special, what would you call it, technology? Uh, it's, it's a beam, almost. It's like a warp beam. It has a name. Uh, but basically, what this thing does is it allows instantaneous teleportation through the warp. Mm -hmm. So it can translate things anywhere it wants. His name is uh, Tucholcha. Tucholcha. Sure. It's been on the planet. The mechanic has been studying it. The Death Card are trying to take it for themselves, and the Iron Hands are there to try and take it back to Gilliman. The lion doesn't trust Gilliman because the no lion's reason. fucking crazy. Um, he thinks that Gilliman's trying to make himself the emperor, which I doubt. Like, I don't think Gilliman is really a person. From what I've seen in the books, the prime which always like, oh, he's always after power. 
I think Gilman just comes off that way because he's smart. Yeah, I agree. No, I don't think he just thinks everything through. Yeah, like Gilman in his mind isn't like, I really want to be the emperor. Gilman's like, I just do things really well. Yeah, he's like, look, I just don't want everything to go to shit. So I'm thinking 10 steps ahead. Mm -hmm. And um, so the lion doesn't trust him. So basically this being T'Chola has decided that it wants to go with the lion. The or, or typhus uses some warp fuckery to try and steal it. Um, but doing this warp fuckery kind of marks him for Nurgle. Yeah, I guess like just like a real quick, like the lion shows up, he pre- he tells him like both legions, like, look, I am here, we are going to have a meeting, and then Lion's basically like, I am taking this, fuck off both of your legions. Mm-hmm. I will let you pass freely through here. Yeah, and um, they're using psychic abilities now, the lion is, to basically make his command, like, people have to follow it. And the only person that doesn't is Typhus. Um, So Typhus, the lion gets there, He it's revealed to him that this being can teleport through the warp or whatnot. Yeah, because it, like, talks to him. Like, it's like, oh, the lion, like, I forgot... Or I've been waiting for you to come back. Yeah, I'd like possesses a person that it talks through. In this yeah, case, he like child. takes over servitors or in yeah. Like children. Yeah. Um, and once it reveals what it can do to the lion, the lion basically tells Typhus and the Iron Hands that he's going to destroy the planet and the being or whatever. And they're not on board with that, but they don't really have a say. So right before the lion destroys the planet, Typhus tries to steal it. And it fails, but the psychic power and the ability he uses to attempt to steal it causes him to be marked by Nurgle, which is cool. Yes, yeah, it was cool because he's like, ah, like there's like a, it was like three, it was like three marks on him or something. Yeah, it's it was the like Nurgle rotting. Symbol. Yeah, the simple Nurgle, um, which is it's kind of where he's like the grandfather has marked me. <laughs> yeah, it was really weird. He has touched my flesh. <laughs> Although, if you remember back in like Flight of Eisenstein, like Typhus was like, "I am the original person that talked to the Chaos Gods." Fuck Erebus. Probably. Well, he said that to Erebus, saying like the Primarchs weren't the original ones. Him and Erebus were. Yeah. Well, but... he was saying like even before like he was before Erebus. I'm pretty sure. Maybe. Um, so. Long story short, the lion did not actually destroy the planet. He took the being for himself. Um, And he was on his way back to fight the Night Lords using that as a weapon. Mm -hmm. But at the very end, he has a conversation with whatever, who knows? There's somebody, he's talking to himself, but there's somebody in the corner that he's also talking to about how he knows that there's something fucked up going on in Caliban. And he just can't trust anybody. He can't trust Gilliman. He can't trust yada yada, whatever, whatever. Yep. And this person comes out and is like, I agree. But you have no idea who the person is. Yeah, it was weird. And I just don't understand, like, why he wouldn't trust Gilman. I feel like if anyone, if there was any of them that like, I would definitely consider would definitely be a loyalist, it would be Gilman. Gilman, Sanguinius, Dorn. Yeah. Yeah, those would be, like, the three I would choose. Probably also... Uh, Lehman Russ. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, interesting story. Lots of like really, like the whole technology thing was really cool. Yeah, super cool. It was a really cool story. So I, it was enjoyable to read the whole time. Uh, so kudos, kudos to that, that story, which was um, that again. It was yeah, Gap mm-hmm. Uh And then we get our last story, which is the Serpent Path, Serpent Beneath. By Rob Sanders. This is a good one. Oh, it is a good one. I don't. What else did Rob Sanders do? I think he also done short, short stories. Yeah, I don't know if he ends up writing any of the books. None that I see right now. So yeah, so maybe just short story stuff. He does some um, other like novellas and stuff like that, but not. Yeah. I don't know. So Rob Sanders, he, he writes The Serpent's Path, Serpent Beneath, 
about the Alpha Legion. And in the beginning of this story, we get an interaction between Omegon and his like the first in command. I can't remember the first in command's name. Um, but basically the conversation well, should be Alfarious, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. They don't do the Alfarious thing in this Yeah, point, they is, even talk about it too. It's good, I think, because it would have been very confusing if it wasn't. Yeah, but there's also that one line where they're like, don't you all call yourselves Alfarious? Then, oh my God, it's like, things have changed. Yeah, he's like, you know what? It's fine. Um, I think this person is... Setabos. Yeah, that's it. So he's talking to Setabos about how there's an outpost, like a secret outpost uh, that the Alpha Legion has, and they are having issues because they think there's a leak. And like, as in, like, some Alpha Legion person is releasing information to whether or not be the Imperium or the traders, they don't know about the Alpha Legion's movements. That's all we have. Yep. Um, and he wants to put together an A team to go in. That's pretty much what it is. Yeah. So he's putting together an A team of Alpha Legionnaires to go in to kill the Alpha Legion at the Alpha Legion base. But he doesn't want the Alpha Legion to know he's hiring Alpha Legion to kill the Alpha Legion. Yes, <laughs> that is very correct. This is such an Alpha Legion story. <laughs> yes, it is. It's almost painful. So this guy, uh, Setabos, he decides that he's going to get together a team. Um, he gets um, a guy named... Sheed... Oh, no. Ranko is the guy he's talking to. Sheed Ranko. Yep. Setabos is the sergeant of the third yeah. company. And uh, set up, they hire the third company. Uh, they also get um, a girl named Zal Magundi. Zal Magundi? Yeah, something like that. Um, she is a psyker that is running from the black ships of the Silent Sisterhood. So she, Renko, goes and gets her for this mission. And then you have um, Volkern Agamoramis, who is a Mechanicum person that actually works at the station, so they're going to use him as an inside man. Yep. So the first, like, third of this book is them gathering this team. It's kind of cool because the, the third company is actually fighting the White Scars. Yeah. So we get to see a little bit more White Scars, but it's just three of them on bikes, and the third mm -hmm. company kicked their ass, um, which is fine. Like, whatever. Yep. <laughs> so, um... Then they go and plan once they have everybody together. They're in a meeting room, and the rest of the book is basically a flash between the meeting room and the mission. They talk about how they're going to infiltrate this base, which is on an asteroid. Um, and this asteroid is actually like a Xenos asteroid that they're mining and delivering to another system, but they're yes. mining it with like robots. Really fucking cool. Yeah, it's a really cool concept. And that's like yeah. why like that species has never been found because it's like random asteroids like no one like expects that yeah and like like the imperium isn't going to go investigate all these random rocks so it's really cool um so it talks about how like the mechanicum is going to help this team get in and how basically they took the psyker and imprisoned her in the in this like facility right Oh, I think my uh, headset died. Nope, you're good. I can hear you. Okay, that was weird. I just lost yeah. you. So they took the Psyker and imprisoned her in this facility, and they used her as an inside person too. So they, like, broke into the the facility, unimprisoned her, and they just started killing everybody. It turned into this big massacre. They created a bunch of chaos. And I'm going to be honest with you, though, I expected the ending to this book. Yeah, I can see it. Because it's Alpha Legion. Like, I knew yeah, from the beginning. Exactly. I was like, this is such a thing. So, you need to hire the Alpha Legion to kill the Alpha Legion, but you don't want the Alpha Legion to know. So, what do you do? You make sure there are no survivors. Yep. So and you're not going to send a Primark to do that. Exactly. So, from the get-go, the third company believed 
that they were going to be rescued by a storm bird. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Appalachian, you know better. So they get in, they do their job. The Psyker's final job is to go in and take this entire asteroid and hurl it towards the sun. And at the end of it, Omegon is with them. And at the end of it, you know, they're sitting there trying to figure out how they're going to escape. And Omegon's like, come on, you know there's no escape. And he opens up his helm, and it's not Omegon, it's Shidrenko. Yeah, which made sense to me, too, because, like, at one point, like, um, the beginning. Oh my, Omegon is injured, and he's, like, not healing. Yeah. And I was like, huh, Primarchs heal, like, super fast. And this right. dude's struggling right now. Yeah, so Shidrenko was very injured, and I'm like, I was very confused too, but for a minute I was like, well, maybe Alpharis and Omegon don't actually heal that fast, because they're kind of not, they're yeah. Primarchs, but they're definitely the weakest, except for, of course, Lorgar, <laughs> of the Primarchs. So it's it's interesting. Um, so yeah, he reveals that it's Shidrenko, and then they hurl the meteorite into the sun. And that, it's a really cool story. There's not a lot of meat to it. Like, everyone dies. Yep. The facility gets shut down. Like, it's a story you should read because it's fun, but there's not, like, any crazy uh, story advancing moments in it. Yeah. Um, and the cool part is really at the very end of the story where you have a conversation between Alpharius and Omegon. Uh, because it's revealed that... Omegon tells Alpharius that somebody I completely lost you. I have no audio coming right now. Oh, you lost me? There we go. Now I can hear you again. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So Omegon tells Alpharius that like somebody's destroyed the the site. Yep. Don't know who. So there's some double agency going on between Alpharius and Omegon, and we're really wondering why. Yeah, I, I really think it's just like I think one's a traitor and one's a loyalist. I hope so, because but, like I, I think it's just like such an alpha thing to play both sides. I I think it's interesting because it's like if Alpharius doesn't know what Omegon is doing, is Omegon a loyalist? Because we see all kinds of like theory videos about well maybe the Alpha Legion is a loyalist legion maybe Omegon's a loyalist Primarch and it's like well if we actually get like proof in the books that would be cool but if we remember the last Al Alpha Legion story we thought they were loyalists because they helped Corvus Corax escape True. come to find out it's for a completely treacherous reason yeah so who knows what's going on? This is what's so frustrating about Alpha Legion stories. You go in with questions, you leave with more questions. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's exactly what happened in this book. It was cool, but it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. I agree. But hey, that's that's Primarchs, though. It's the Primarchs book. I, I enjoyed it. There were some highs and lows, for sure, as you get with I all the info. I definitely feel like it dragged on this one i think the, the stories were just so long that like i'm really excited to start going through more if you're to tread like i'm 10 percent of the way through i think just because like i really want like a solid story whereas yeah. like this one i'm like i don't care about these people especially like the fist of iron fire and fist ones like, i don't care yeah i get that but next week we're going to be talking about the books the authors what we think about them and the Primarchs as a whole, not just the book, but the mm -hmm. other Primarchs that we've seen so far. So probably going to exclude Primarchs like Vulcan Lost and the Khan. Yeah, we're still probably going to exclude like Vulcan and the Khan and Primarchs we haven't really seen a lot of, but mm -hmm. we have a lot of context from a lot of other Primarchs. So we're going to be redoing our rankings, we're going to redo a ranking of the books, we can talk about what our favorites are, what our must reads, what are our ones you can skip. Stuff like that. Mm. Yep, it'll be a good time. I love those episodes. They're always fun. And after mm -hmm. that, we will do our preview for Fear to Tread. So, guys, look forward to next week where we just... It's one of our Shoot the Shit episodes. They're always yep. fun. If you have certain books that you think like are skippable or must-reads, let us know. If you're on our Discord, we are going to 
share our list with our Discord and let them mess with our list how they think would be best. Get some, you know, some fun fan, fan interaction. You can make sure you join our Discord. You can do that by getting on our Twitter at Heresy Lodge. It is pinned to the top. You can email us at theheresylodge at gmail.com. And you can also ask on YouTube. I can always throw it on there anywhere. We just like to have a good time with you guys. For sure. Yep. Is there anything else you want to add for this episode, Gavin? I think that's it. I'm excited for next week. Um, I'm super far ahead in the reading. So I think I'm, I, I've given myself enough room to take a bit of a break, which is good, because I think it's good to take a break from reading every once in a while to kind of get yourself back into it. So very pumped yeah, for sure. the future. Yeah, so that's it, guys. That is our review of Primarchs, and we'll see you next week for the other fun. You guys have a good one.